Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. Today on the show, I have Nathan Cole, first associate concertmaster of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. I invited Nathan on the show because he really is not only a leader in his orchestra, he's a leader in music business with a new way of teaching, which is highly personalized online group programs. What's so great about his program design is that by teaching in this way, you can finally scale your teaching and stop trading dollars for hours. We talk about his first launch of his program, which is called the Virtuoso Master Course. Nathan tells the story of how his teaching evolved from where it started, teaching in person, to starting to experiment with teaching online and finding an online school to expand his reach, to eventually, with the help of a business coach, growing his audience online and offering larger programs on his own. This style of program is very different from one-on-one private lessons because while each participant does get private lessons, they also get a lot of extra value from group technique classes and master classes and a video library that Nathan has worked on filling up for a long time as well as the community and accountability and support of the group. This model is very similar to how I designed the Visibility Workshop and is really a super valuable way to up-level your income while at the same time bringing an immense amount of value to your students. Nathan and I go into all the details of how he got started and how he was supported through this process. Also, if you're a violinist and you're looking to up-level your own playing and reach bigger goals in 2020 and beyond, Nathan's program might be the way for you. You can find out more about joining his program at his website, natesviolin.com, under the Courses tab, and the link is in the show notes. But before we get started, I'd like to thank Fix Music for sponsoring Crushing Classical Podcast. Fix is your online resource for high-quality, affordable sheet music. Fix is now offering business accounts for choruses, orchestras, libraries, churches, and universities. This includes volume discounts of up to 25%. They've partnered with FedEx to offer two-day shipping at insanely low prices, even to Alaska and Hawaii. They continue to expand the catalog with everything from high-quality jazz method books to elegant hardcover Urtex editions and everything in between. They love their customers and are open to suggestions on what to carry, which they're more than thrilled to get. It's kind of like crowdsourcing their inventory. And as always, free shipping on all domestic orders. Use the link in the show notes to receive 10% off your first order. Let's get started. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show today, Nate. Of course. Thanks for having me, Tracy. So great to have you on. So, of course, you know, I know you from Chicago when you're in the Chicago Symphony. You've had such a fantastic career. Now you're in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Um, and now you're invo- evolving into, well, you've brought, have you already, already been a teacher? Um, I, you know, I, I've taught for a long time. I think because both my parents were, you know, music, they were professional musicians, but specifically teachers. And so I saw that mm. from the time I was, you know, before I could walk apparently. Yeah. Crawling oh, into amazing. lessons and that kind of thing. Are your parents violinists? They're flutists actually, both of them. Both of them. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And even, uh, you know, my dad's dad who just died a couple of years ago, but he was a flutist in the Philadelphia orchestra and he taught at Wisconsin Madison for decades. Um, so he was, uh, yeah, teachings been in the family for a while. Wow. That's amazing. So, um, and so now you, so you started was Chicago symphony, your first job. You know, I had, um, I was principal second in the St. Paul chamber orchestra for okay. two years after school. Um, At that point, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be in an orchestra. And that sort of seemed like a nice hybrid between chamber music and symphony. Yeah, it was a nice hybrid. (laughs) (laughs) And and then I went to CSO and I was there for nine years before coming Mm -hmm. here to LA. Okay, awesome. And then that's when I met you. But actually, I've actually gotten to know you a little more since you've been in LA, which is kind of funny. Um, I know. (laughs) So, um, so tell me about like what I find so fascinating about your career is that you are super successful and kind of, you know, living the dream as classical music goes, like you've gotten into two big five orchestras and, and yet you're still an entrepreneur creating, creating online 
teaching as a way of um, a facet of your career. So tell me a little bit about how you got started teaching online. Well, it was really, it, you know, it came out of teaching in person. And mm -hmm. I think that's true for most people who teach anything, you know, that that's what we grew up with. That's what we know. Yeah. And it's just that, you know, it's the easiest, the, the oldest way to interact with someone is just to be in the same room with them. So I was, when I was in the Chicago Symphony, I found myself teaching a lot of lessons, of course, for auditions. People come to people in orchestras if they want to get an orchestra right. job. And so when I forget if it was an actual um, Chicago Symphony audition or, or it could have been any other orchestra, something was coming up. And so a lot of people came to my place in Chicago to play the list for me. So obviously mm -hmm. it's the same list for everybody. You're hearing the same music over and over. Um, you can't help but notice that you end up saying a lot of the same things <laughs> to yeah. everybody. Yeah. And you know, that that's not, <laughs> it's not because everybody's so bad and they all need the same. It's because of me too. It's because of the teacher, you know, every teacher has certain things that they just repeat over and over. Right. Right. Um, so I found myself doing that. And I think at the end of one long day, I, I was kind of fatigued and, and I thought, you know, it might be great if before someone came to play for me, I could kind of could send them a primer, you know, it's like, yeah. what, go ahead and work on these things before you even get here. And then, you know, you won't have to listen to me say them. Right. Um, and, you know, now we have, uh, you know, that's a business model or an education model. Um, but back then it just seemed like something that I had thought of, but it, even though I hadn't really thought of it. <laughs> right. So um, essentially, would you just send them a video and say, Hey, check this out first. Well, you know, I didn't end up getting around uh, to doing that. I, but I did, yes, I did decide that video would be the best way to do it. Um, and so I made a video and I wasn't sure what I would do with it at that point. I, I think the year would have been probably 2008 or nine or something like that. Okay. Um, so YouTube wasn't exactly brand new, but I hadn't ever done anything with it. Um, and it certainly wasn't as popular as it's become now. So I thought I'll make this video. I, I chose an excerpt that I had worked on a ton and, and an excerpt that seemed to have the same difficulties for most people. And mm -hmm. that was the scherzo from Schumann's second symphony in the first yep. violin part called the Schumann scherzo. So made a video of that and it <laughs> kind of took all day. Um, I wasn't happy with any of the takes, you know, I, I, I was still kind of stuck in classical recording mode. Like you've got to, you know, it's got to be perfect. And um, so I eventually got a take that I thought was okay. And the focus, you know, I hadn't made a lot of videos before, so I had to figure out how to set up the camera. And then I saw that my background looked horrible. We had some, <laughs> I don't know, junk on the table. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want people seeing that. <laughs> so yeah, it, just, it took all day. And, and I made a few kind of supplemental videos like, okay, here's the performance, but then here's, here are the ways I would work on it. Right. And I put those all up on YouTube and you know, I felt pretty good about it. Like, Ooh, it's out there. Um, and I, I had written some things. I, I had, I had had a website for eight years at that point, um, but kind of off and on. Um, but here I felt like, okay, this is the first video I'm putting out there. And, um, you know, it got some response. I mean, got response from the people you would think it would get a response from people that were trying to solve the riddle of that excerpt and yeah. wanted some help with it or just kind of wanted to see how to play it because, you know, you can buy a recording of that piece. But at that point, I think there was only one other recording that you could really listen to to hear how just the violin part would sound by itself. Right. So you essentially, it sort of sounds pretty organic. Like you recognize like this is an excerpt. Like you started with one excerpt. Like for anyone who's like, how, where do I start? Like this is a good example of you started with one thing. Right. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, and it was going to <laughs> originally, you know, it, it filled a need for me. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, of course, uh, the people that I thought might come to play for me as well. But 
obviously the people that were responding online were not people that were coming to play for me. They were just people all over the world that were working on this. So I didn't know who they might be. And so then were they like, okay, can you make, can you make a video for, I don't know, another excerpt? Yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, <laughs> there would be <laughs> questions for that. They would be like, yeah, well, well how about Brahms this? And how about Mozart this? And Strauss <laughs> yeah. and, um, which I, I thought was great. Um, and part of me was not, resentful is not the right word, but I kind of thought, I'm like, do you know how long it took me to do this? It was like a whole, <laughs> you know, whole week's project, you know, and now you want all these other things. And, um, and but then I thought, you know, they're, they're right. There, there should be videos for all these. And I would actually look forward to making them. So you know, I told my wife, Akiko, who's a uh, violinist at that time, we were both in the Chicago Symphony. And um, I was like, yeah, I, I want to make these for, you know, all the excerpts, like 20, 30 excerpts. And, you know, she said, it took you a week to do this one. <laughs> like, what, are we never going to go out again or like, <laughs> watch movies or cook? Or um, And I thought, yeah, that I'm just not sure really when that would happen. So that overwhelming feeling that you were referring to earlier right right so did you end up making more excerpts or did did you like how did that how did that pan out well i you know it i i lost a little bit of enthusiasm (laughs) after once once i looked uh, at how much time that might realistically take now at that time too like i said i was sort of stuck in that um quality mindset like it has to be not just quality but it has to be perfect yeah. Um, so that was standing in my way at that time. Um, I wasn't thinking of the people that I might be helping necessarily. I was thinking of myself. You know, I want <laughs> to make perfect videos for, you know, all these excerpts. And um, just, that is just the way things had always worked. That's what a recording was. Yeah. Um, and you know what? That's such a great point to bring up because um, that's a lot of what stands in everybody's way when they're trying to create a presence online you know, that like, it has to be perfect. And so you're so consumed with like how, whether or not it's helping some, instead of being consumed with like, whether or not it's helping somebody else, you're just thinking, oh my God, like, how am I going to look if this isn't totally perfect? You know? Right. And you know, it, it's good. It's great actually to think about quality, um, especially if you define yourself partly by the quality of the work you do. It, it's nice mm-hmm. to have that in there. Um, but there has to be a balance. Uh, of course, exactly. I look back, you know, that the, this video that we're talking about is still up on YouTube. And I look back at it sometimes and laugh. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> very different from the videos I would make now, but it's still helping people out there. So, so I'm, I leave it up. I'm glad it's up there. That's cool. Um, well, I know that like one of your videos um, got like tons and tons of views because you were playing, was it the Milstein Strad or some yes. Stradivarius, right? Yes, I, I had the chance to borrow uh, Nathan Milstein's old, old <laughs> violin, amazing. and yeah, and it, it was. A, I had almost returned it. My time was almost up, and then I thought, oh, you know, I should, I should just get something on video. Yeah. Uh, with this, and yeah, you know, people, people want to see famous instruments, and um, that the nice thing about that video was that I was playing a cadenza for the Beethoven Violin Concerto that Nathan Milstein wrote. So the chance to play his music on his instrument, um, that was really fun. That's so cool. That's so cool. So how did it grow then with like getting more subscribers on YouTube? And I mean, is this kind of what fueled your, your desire to do more stuff online, kind of coupled with that you were already teaching people in person? It, it was. I mean, the, making that first video and seeing the response, which was, you know, as things are online, it was pretty immediate. Um, I certainly wasn't thinking big picture. Uh, uh-huh. I was a little bit stuck. You know, my mindset was, okay, there's just, there's no way I can do this on my own. Um, if I'm going to make more of these videos, I need help. And so I immediately started looking for, you know, who I could team up with to do this. And, and it became a much bigger project in my mind. Um, you know, and I've second guessed this <laughs> for years, but yeah, the way it, ended up was that I um, found an online education company. Uh, I, no, I, yeah, I said found, right? I didn't found one. <laughs> you found it. You discovered it. One. <laughs> yes. Um, and so th- this company, Artist Works, was already um, 
helping people in other genres of music, bluegrass, rock. Um, and they were doing something that seemed right along the lines of what I wanted to do. And so I was able to start working with them as their classical violin teacher. So it was not, in that way, I was not dealing with just excerpts, but the violin in general. Uh -huh. And so I actually didn't make any more of my own videos for quite a while um, because I was involved with uh, working with them. Right. And speak, you know, talking about quality, I mean, that was a real, you know, that was all done in a studio. It was planned out way in advance with scripts and, and everything like that. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense. And like, um, probably at that time, not a lot of people were doing their own thing. So it, it kind of made sense. That was like your next move to do. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't, I didn't, I certainly didn't see anybody else out there <laughs> putting <laughs> up uh, a lot of helpful violin videos. And, um, you know, maybe I wasn't looking hard enough, but but this seemed like the only way I was going to be able to get my message out there at that right. time. Right, right. But um, you still had a blog at that time? I, you know, at that time, I really was not doing much with that. Um, okay. And I, I don't know why. I actually got my domain name, natesviolin.com, when I got my first job in St. Paul. You know, it was my first time um, having large sections of the day free to do whatever I wanted. So I, you know, bought a domain name back in 2000 and... <laughs> Started put, I, I started a practice journal. That was my original idea for the site. And I, I just, you know, I, I wasn't organized about it. And so I would put something up there and get some response, which should have been encouraging. And, um, but then I would just think, oh, how narcissistic is this? Like, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to put my thoughts on violin playing up there and expect people to read them. And I would just, I would always kind of lose courage. Um, right. Because I didn't have any, I wasn't thinking of the people who might be reading. I was, I was afraid of what um, people might think of me rather than thinking of how I might help. Other people. Yeah. And that's so, I mean, that's how everyone feels, right? That's exactly how everyone feels. I mean, when I first started crushing classical, I was like, who am I to even talk about this career? You know, just because I, you know, cause I say so like, that's the reason, you know what I mean? Right. So, and, but people, people that read it aren't thinking, who's this, who's this person to say like they're like oh there's something I might learn you know it's so funny like we don't remember how they're probably really thinking we just think the worst it's so it's so interesting so you what year was that that you that you bought that domain domain name again I think it was right in 2000 when I started my first job so I love that because that's so early for anyone really to have yeah a website you know and like I the first thing that that came into my mind was I thought like you know, there's some people who are just early adopters. I think that's really awesome. Like the first people to buy an iPhone when it first came out, like right. I was, I remember going like, you just paid $500 for a phone. Like I, I, that's not something I'm going to do, you know? And then like, it took me years and years and then I got one. And then like, I mean, even as far back as like my parents were like one of the last people to get a VCR. It's like, <laughs> it's really good if you can jump on the boat, like right when right when something's new because because then you get to experience something as it evolves yeah and, and my interest in that was always pretty um techie i i have never um thought of myself as having a, a mind for business uh, or you know for for the bigger picture i just i got my first computer for christmas when i was four years old i mean this is back in the early 80s um so i mean really ever since then i've just uh, yeah, cameras, microphones, computers, like that all that stuff just fascinates me. So, you know, my interest in getting a domain name was I wanted to build my own website in HTML. I wanted to take digital photos and edit them and put them up. And, you know, I, I had yeah. no real thoughts beyond that. I mean, <laughs> blogging software wasn't really around. So, you know, if I had a thought on violin playing, I would, you know, code a very basic page in HTML and put it up there. And then, I guess people would find it if they searched, you know, an Alta Vista or Google. <laughs> that's so amazing though, because you got the start and really that's how it grew. And, you know, even if you didn't have like a, a, like a big picture, it did evolve towards that way. So then, so eventually now you have a thriving blog, website, business teaching. So I want to like find out how you got from, you know, this year, the year 2000, 
basic website te- and then to teaching on artist works to now you have a program and and like link us up to like point A to point B, like how you got there. Sure. Yeah, well, I, I and I had plenty of help with this. Um, I have always had a hard time asking myself the basic questions about, you know, how I spend my time, um, what it is that I want to be doing. I, I think like many people, especially musicians, uh, those patterns were just set from the time I was a kid. You know, if you're going to learn a piece, you've got to practice this amount of time. Um, mm-hmm. And that turns into, if you're going to perform in such and such a way, you have to do these things. If you're going to have a career, you have to take these steps. And so, you know, for me, I found myself teaching, um, yes, on somebody else's platform, which is exactly what I had wanted to do. And I wasn't asking myself, you know, is this the kind of teaching I most want to do? You know, mm-hmm. it it seemed to check some boxes for some things that I had wanted for myself um, in years past, but I wasn't asking myself if, if it's what I really wanted. And ultimately, I decided that I was spending a little too much of my time with students that weren't benefiting the most from from what I had to offer. You know, I thought there were other teachers out there um, better suited to teaching people who had just started playing, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could, t- you know, when I stopped to think about it, I could tell the the people that I was super excited about working with. And it wasn't always that they were the most advanced players or anything like that, but they brought a certain attitude. They had a certain curiosity about the inner workings of the violin and the practice room. You know, it was just for lack of a better term, they were my kind of people. <laughs> right. Your ideal, your ideal client, your ideal student. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, that again, I was locked into thinking about students. Like I'm a teacher, you know, students walk through the door. I do what I can for them. Um, you know, I wasn't, the thought of choosing who I was going to work with um, would not have occurred to me. Right. Especially not in the sort of wide open world of the internet. Um, you know, when I thought internet, I thought, well, that's, that's the great big wide world. I just, you know, if I'm going to do anything business-wise on there, I've got to reach every violinist in the world and, and hope that some of them want to work with me. Interesting. And so you're, you're discovering, I mean, this is really, this is great. Like you're kind of honing in on like when you're enjoying teaching the most, what kind of student, like what are some qualities of that student and sort of realizing I want to teach the kind of student that, that I want to teach. Like, you know, it's true. It's true. As a musician, you, you're sort of like, well, I'm a teacher. I, I could teach anybody that wants to learn it, learn my instrument or I can play any gig that I'll get hired for. You know what I mean? Right. So that's because great. The alternative seems really scary. Like yeah. if you have a certain number of gigs or a certain number of students, you, <laughs> your first thought is not going to be, well, what if I just, you know, got rid of half of those gigs or half of those students. Um, yeah. Obviously that <laughs> seems like you're going to be doing half as oh, well. Oh, totally. Oh my gosh. I know. Cause you can't imagine some other better thing taking its place. And like, I remember, um, it was a few years ago, but I remember my husband, he teaches a lot of violin lessons and um, David would come out of these lessons with these, with the sister brother duo. They would each take a turn. And every time he'd be like, oh my God, I really can't, I can't do it anymore. Like these people. And then I'd be like, you need to let them go. Just let them go. And and he was like, oh, but you know, you know, he was trying to justify like it's money, blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, it's not worth it. And he, he actually did let them go. And then only like maybe a week or two later, someone else, cause it was like two kids who took a 30 minute lesson each and someone else replaced them. And it was someone who was like more motivated and more driven and the right kind of student. So that's just a really great message to like, that's a really th- great thing to bring up. Yes. And when I say I had help, you know, I, I really did. Cause I, I just, I, I think in the day to day, uh, I would not have given myself time to ask these questions or right. to come to these realizations. So um, Jennifer Rosenfeld, yes, um, you know, 
uh, I was able to find her through a recommendation from an LA Phil colleague because at this point now I was in the LA Phil mm -hmm. and basically I, I came to her asking how can I get more students at my online school which at that you know it was not really mine it was um, owned by the company and you know her her direct you know I'm sure she was kind of smiling slash laughing inside but um <laughs> the way she put it to me was you know why don't you increase your profile and then when people find you they could join you there at that school or you know for whatever else might come along for you later and i thought oh that's you know what else what else is going to come along i mean I, I just want them to come to my school here um but obviously um that was the right way to go and so she encouraged so she me sort to, of planted the seeds like you could really do this you know in your own space and not work for another platform essentially she you know she didn't even I, I think she knew me well enough uh at least in our initial conversations she knew that that might scare me a little bit uh-huh so we she didn't even bring that up it was just kind of obliquely uh, okay get get people to to find you let everyone in the world know who you are and what you're about. And then, you know, if they're going to join you there at the school, they'll do that or just, yeah, you, you'll or have they'll them follow you on YouTube yeah. or they'll join your blog or they'll join your mailing list. So she was like encouraging you to just, you know, grow the audience and see what happens. Exactly. And, you know, I should say that I had the luxury of time because I, I knew that none of the things I was putting out, you know, videos, articles, whatever they might be, uh, I was not going to sell any of them because I was working, you know, uh, for this company and oh, okay. you know, I couldn't do you were, I couldn't you weren't allowed. Sell things on my own. Right. Okay. And that just makes sense. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, <laughs> if you're working for a company, you can't do the same kind of work. <laughs> yeah on the side and compete with yourself and all that. And that, that, that was always understood from the beginning. So uh -huh. actually that freed me quite a bit because I thought, well, I don't have to worry about, this is not a business. This is just fun. And, um, and it actually helped me teach better, I believe. Um, you know, if I could see how anonymous <laughs> strangers reacted to a certain practice technique, then I would have a much better idea of knowing how someone in the room or, you know, on a live camera might react. Yeah. And, you know, I really like that point of view, you know, because sure, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of people who have thought about teaching online and, or, you know, creating some, creating content that they can, that will support the work that they want to do, that they want to offer and, and make money from. And, but the idea of letting go of that attachment to like, it's going to look like this and I, I need to make this amount of money. Like it was built in for you, which is nice, but um, you know, cause you couldn't anyway with the contract, but like, I wonder what it would be like if, if, I mean, it would kind of free you up if you just approached it. Like I'm just putting out content to see what happens, you know, without pressure. Right. You know? Yeah. I, I don't know what I would have done, you know, had I had the opportunity right from the beginning to try and make it a business. Um, I'm sure I would have thought a lot smaller for one thing. And I would have again been locked into the kinds of models that I had seen before. Uh -huh. uh, which, and there weren't very many. Um, but what I had seen out there, you know, there were people selling video cassettes or eventually DVDs. Um, there was, I, I had referred earlier to a, a series of excerpt CDs. I, I think they probably have one for horn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for All violin. Kinds. It was yeah. the concert master of the Cleveland orchestra, William Prusil. And that CD was famous for, you know, 20 years or something. Cause it was the only thing out there if you wanted right. to. And, you know, extreme, obviously really well played, but yeah, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to hear how these excerpts sounded, you were buying that CD. That was the reference. Yeah. Frame. So the frame of reference. So, you know, my thinking, I'm sure at that time would have been, well, you know, I can, I'll make my own excerpt CD and yeah, maybe it won't be a physical CD, but I'll, I'll sell it on my website, you know, so right. for 1595 or whatever <laughs> CD costs, you can get this. And um, I'm sure that's where my thoughts would have gone. 
Right. Yeah. Cause you're just, so that's the power of having a coach too. someone else who yeah. can think, who can, who can help you think bigger or at least plant the seeds for, for what um, is coming, you know, while you just work on the thing. I like right. that actually, you know? And, you know, Jennifer's thought, um, or at least what I understood at the time was, uh, yeah, you could, <laughs> it was always like, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, you know, you could do anything. You, anything's open to you. But <laughs> let me just ask you this, you know, what, what happens to someone when they, let's say they get your excerpt CD or we'll call it a collection of audio tracks or video tracks or something, you know, what, what kind of changes are going to happen for them? And I would think, oh, well, they're going to know maybe how these things sound. They'll know the tempos. Um, I may be able to share some practice techniques with them. And she was always asking what, you know, what if you could make a bigger change for someone or, you know, who are the players that you think you could help the most? Uh, you talked about an ideal before and mm -hmm. um, these conversations were about that. What, what stage of life is someone in? How do they practice? You know, what, what's their mindset um, to make those really big changes? And so that's when we started working together on, on something that would be a little bit more substantial than just a few videos. Yeah. And so much more hands-on. Right. You know, then you get to see, because if you just drop someone, you know, the CD is available, it's sort of like, it's sort of like the online programs that people buy, like courses where you just buy it. It's pre, it's pre-recorded video. You don't know the person who buys it and you don't know what happens after they do it. So it's like, see, she was suddenly having you look at how could you work with someone to make a bigger impact and how could you discover the exact person that you want to work with too. That's so interesting. Right. And, and it is true that the, the very first things I sold were, you know, they were based on an online course model and they were based on, it was kind of a hybrid of that and the excerpt CD, if you will. Uh -huh. um, you know, I looked at an upcoming audition and for the very first thing I sold uh, it was for an upcoming violin audition. And so let's say there were 16 excerpts on the list. I made videos for all 16 of those excerpts with my performances and how to work on them. And you could purchase that as a package. Now, you know, obviously anybody taking this audition would be super highly motivated. Yeah. You know, this was not supposed to be necessarily for the whole wide world of violinists, but it was going to be targeted really at those people who were most going to need the help. And there was an option if you wanted to work with me personally, then that was a different package. You know, it would include all those videos, but it would include um, some group work. Um, for that one, I kept the group work anonymous, which was, <laughs> that was, took some doing, but, um, and then also a private session as well. Interesting. How did they do the group work anonymously? So it was audio only. It was live, but it was audio only, and I had everyone use um, a pseudonym. Like so, on a Zoom call, they would just come in with a different yep. name and not, not click the video, and then you're anonymous. Right. So I was on camera. Uh-huh. Um, nobody else was on camera. And, you know, I had everyone's email address in the group. So, you know, I would email the group, you know, BCC and say, okay, here's the, the link to our meeting and go ahead and email me if you're going to play or email me your questions in advance or whatever. And then when the meeting would start, I'd say, okay, it's uh, Yasha Heifetz is going to play in the Schumann scare. <laughs> <laughs> then whoever was Yasha Heifetz, but I, I don't think anybody took that, that pseudonym. You know, nobody would be so bold. That's um, funny. And you know, I like, I'm immediately envisioning like the people that they, maybe they downloaded that special like vo voice software so they could be like, oh, yeah. rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> change their voice. I know that. I mean, it, it was, it, it was, it was a little strange. I mean, it had to be that way because it was for a specific and upcoming audition. And I just, yeah. I knew nobody was good. You're not going to do this thing with everybody else who's about to compete against you. Right. Um, I mean, 
you might do it if you're all on the same team, like a cycling team or, you know, gymnastics team or something like that. But, but for the, it just would have been too, yeah. yeah. Now, the funny thing is now my thinking has changed on that. I, I think there are quite a few people who actually might welcome the camaraderie and, and to have it be not anonymous. But uh-huh. at least for those first couple, I did that a couple of times, a couple of different auditions. And that was really fun. But I, I did miss the open camaraderie, um, real names, yeah. faces, um, voices. So uh, I decided that probably the future of what I wanted to do lay elsewhere. But but I was really encouraged um, by how this had gone, the, the help that people got from that. Um, and also the, the rewards for my time, um, which I had felt were... <laughs> I was kind of running out of steam um, before, and this was the first thing that made me think, okay, this could really work. Interesting. Yeah. Because when you're, when you're teaching one-on-one only, that's a lot of time. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's great as, as anybody knows who's taught, it's great when you do have those students that are super rewarding. I mean, you, I don't want to say you don't need money, but you know, you, (laughs) as long as you're sort of fairly compensated, you feel like I I'm looking forward to spending this time. Right. Um, but that's very hard to have a studio of students, all that you, you know, just love spending time with. Um, <laughs> that's just, that's almost never going to happen. So um, yeah, I needed some way to find the people that I was going to really enjoy working with or, or give them a chance to find me. And then, have it worth my time to set all of this up and you know there's equipment involved and all of that so those are the kind of questions that Jennifer really helped me with that's awesome and so then so now it's evolved because um it's not is it still audition based not entirely um I do I, I give people the chance to work on that or to focus on that if that's what they want but um what I asked myself was what what really makes the difference you know for for a violinist let's say to winning an audition or sorry to win an audition or always to be stuck you know on the outside you know not advancing things like that I I I approached it from the audition standpoint Uh and I decided for myself it was really we always talk about audition prep and audition process and and those things are very important, but, you know, ultimately I decided that the people that we pick to win these auditions generally are just stronger players. They're just better. Yeah. (laughs) Which which, uh, in a way is, um, you know, it's kind of a cruel world, but, you know, then I thought, well, then, you know, maybe that's what the program should be because that's ultimately I, I do enjoy preparing auditions and helping people think about that. But what I enjoy more is just playing the violin better. Right. Um, Yeah. Playing all the great music that's out there, not just the audition material. But um, so I thought if I can, it's kind of like the fitness world, you know, if I can get someone in great shape, then they could play any sport. Totally. Um, That makes so much sense. And so that's, that's what uh, I call it the virtuoso master course. And it's a six month program as opposed to more like six weeks that I was doing with the audition prep. Okay. Um, so it's really, it's about building that super strong foundation and of course, applying it to auditions if that's what you want to do. Um, but not necessarily. That's great. And so like basically doing those first programs probably informed you, like maybe you, you realized, yeah, I'd really like to work with these people longer or, you know, even though you're getting this, intensive help on these specific excerpts really what we need to work on is the your bow technique or i don't know just making stuff up but like yeah. you you know you got you got in, information from that to go you know what i really would like 6 months and really go to like the root cause of what's make what's holding these people back or you know help what's holding anybody back from advancing in an audition or winning an audition goes straight to that technique and musical stuff that you want to talk about about the violin so I like I like that that's great so so you so then you launched you launched your program in in uh was it last summer that you launched it uh just before the summer yeah late May okay and Jennifer helped you like design the 
the framework for it and the training, like the free challenge you did before it and everything like that too? She did, absolutely. And I was always, um, you know, as, as the violinist, as the teacher, all the info I wanted to put out about it was all like, these are the etudes we're going to work, we're going to work yeah, yeah. through these techniques. And it's, and, you know, she kept saying, it's not, nobody cares. Not that nobody cares because yeah. obviously <laughs> violinists care, but um, in terms of people deciding whether they're going to take part in it or not, it's not going to be based on what etudes you do. It's about what's going to happen for them. Exactly. <laughs> at the end of six months. Yeah. So it was like reworking that, the messaging yeah. around that too. Yeah. yeah that's I, so... I would come up with a draft that was just chock full of text. <laughs> a lot of text. <laughs> a lot of detail. <laughs> and, and then she would go, okay, let's back it up. <laughs> yep. That's like, awesome. You know, put, put this way down there, you know, if, if people really want to read, you know, <laughs> a long document, <laughs> you can put it near the end, but yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love it. So then, um, so then, so you did the launch and, and then you, you enrolled people through sales calls, right? Right. And, and then you, how many people joined your program? Um, in the end it was 20, um, because we had originally, I had set a limit of 10. Um, and you know, then Jennifer asked, well, what if you get more than 10? And I, I said, oh, it's never going to happen. But okay, let, <laughs> let's say I did. I really, I think more than 10 is too big a group. And so she asked, well, could you have two groups? And I thought, yeah, I guess that will work. So yeah, 20 will be the max then. So we, I got 20. So you got two groups. And so, so you're, it's been, is it, has the program finished now? Um, it, it should have finished because uh, six months have gone by, but um. I had, especially this being the first one, um, you know, some difficulties came up and we had a couple tours and there's travel. I think I got sick once. And so I'm extending it a little way just to, you know, to help everyone finish up those projects that they've been working on. And to, that's cool. Um, so it's uh, going to finish just after the new year, which is about the same time that the, the next group is launching. That's amazing. So, so what, like looking back, since May, since the whole idea of doing this, how do you feel about this style of teaching? I love it. I, it's just, it's something that I was never really able to experience um, before as a violinist, just because I never was part of a big studio um, that met regularly. Uh -huh. I had wonderful teachers. Um, I started in the Suzuki method and and so, you know, I had one teacher from when I was, let's say, up to 10 years old. And then I had another great teacher from when I was 10 to 18 before I went to school. Um, in the Suzuki method, of course, you do a lot of group playthroughs and things like that. But, you know, that, that was not necessarily high level technique stuff. And when I had my second teacher, I just spent a lot of time with him. But we didn't have a lot of studio class. You know, I was 11 years old and his other kids were in college. So, um, and even in conservatory, I, my teachers didn't have very many students. So again, I wasn't meeting with a big studio on a weekly basis. Um, I'd always kind of heard about that. And so that's what I wanted to replicate. And um, that's the aspect I think that's been the most fun, just, you know, getting to meet with um, these folks twice a week, really, in addition to our individual time. That's great. So you really liked it. You really liked the framework for it. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I think the best contributions came from uh, the members of the of the studio, really. Invariably, what would happen in the group meetings is, you know, someone would ask a question like, oh, you know, this is kind of a dumb question, but... And then immediately four or five other people in the group would say, oh, no, I, I'm glad you asked that because I had that same question. And I didn't want to ask it. And <laughs> um, so then we'd have, you know, that, that's when we get to the discussions that really mattered or demonstrations from me or the others that really mattered. That's so awesome. That, yeah. Yeah. So the hive mind and the group camaraderie all contributed in a way that like probably you didn't, you didn't um, predict or you couldn't have predicted. 
Right. Going in. And, you know, just like I'm talking about having a coach, you know, that was so important. That is so important for the people that I'm working with too. They, the word that comes up over and over is accountability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes that seems like that has a negative connotation. Like, you know, I'm going to hold you accountable for how you're <laughs> practicing your scales, but you right. know, people want that. They, they, and they also want to know that sometimes I don't practice my scales and right. they want to see how I react if, if I get sick or if I get busy for two weeks and I'm not practicing or playing the way I want, you know, what's my next step. And, uh, you know, when I can demonstrate that the world's not going to end and my playing is not going to go into the tank, um, yeah. you know, then that, that helps everybody weather those times where, you know, you, you don't have as much time. The people I work with are generally, um, they're out of school. Um, so their time is not always their own. Uh huh. Yeah. Cause they have jobs. Yeah jobs, families, uh, or some have uh, separate careers, you know, they're not full-time uh, musicians. Okay. And so this, this is really a hobby for them, a very serious hobby, obviously, if they're going to invest time and money with me. But, um, you know, the other things may have to come first, just as for me now, other things, my family has to come first. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I know things change when you're, when you're out of school. And, you know, I really like that you brought this up because, um, you know, all the other benefits and sort of the, the other things that are coming up in the program that people are getting out of it, that's extra value because um, like and Jennifer, as she's my coach as well. And like, she's, she just taught a free training where she introduced the concept of this style of teaching and charging you know, five figure amounts to, to take, to study and take lessons and join a program or, you know, create a program like this for your students. And I think what comes up for people who teach them is, or who are thinking about teaching a program like this is, well, how can I justify that price or whatever? And so, right. um, and that's one of the things that Jennifer talked about a lot during her free training was that, you know, it's, it's an experience that you're taking people on and there's so much more than just you show up, whatever ends up on the stand is what you do that during that hour. And then you leave and you go back to your life. Like it's, it's more of an immersive experience. And what's exciting about it is that it could potentially change, um, like your, st this style when more people are doing it could potentially change like the way that people go about getting educated in music at all. I mean, it already happened in the business world. Like people, people who want to start businesses don't, don't go get MBAs. Usually they, they seek out a coach and, and take programs online, you know? So I love, I'm happy that it's happening in our space. Yes. And I just think for, for too long, um, yeah, musical training, musical education, uh, Again, it's checking boxes. I mean, if, yes, you need a, a good teacher, um, but to really play an instrument well, it's very few people that can just go the traditional route, have a good teacher, have a certain number of lessons, go to a good school, and you're a great player. It yeah. just usually doesn't quite work out that way. Yeah. Um, even with the best of intentions. So, you know, having other people around you more than just your teacher, um, having other people around you who can support you and just getting more, uh, more time and more help. I mean, you can go to the best conservatory and, you know, I, I, I went to Curtis and it was great. I still only had, you know, whatever it is, 12 lessons, maybe in a, in a semester, 12 right. hours with a teacher. Um, so, you know, the things I learned were much more often from, my fellow students, yep. uh, you know, wh whatever may have happened, you know, off, <laughs> off campus, like w asking questions, you know, how, how do you practice this? How do you practice that? Oh, totally. Yeah. When you're in the practice rooms or, I mean, I remember having, um, having friends of mine say, Hey, you know what? Let's, let's play for each other. Let's just get a room tonight. Let's get one of those bigger practice rooms, you know, and just play excerpts for each other. And like those, I feel like those memories stand out to me for some reason more than 
particular lessons that I took, you know? So it's, it's really a great point, you know, that like, and I've always thought it too, like, um, Olympic coaches or Olympic athletes have coaches constantly. Like they don't go to the Olympics. Like if, if an audition is the Olympics and you're, you're like preparing for the Olympics, why don't you have a coach, you know? Oh yeah. So it's just, it's really, it's, it's about time. And I'm really happy that it's starting to go that direction. And I think there's, you know, more and more, more and more people are, I think probably going to start thinking about doing this kind of thing online. But one of the things I want to ask you is as musicians start thinking about this, you know, I know there's some people, I know there's one other, um, one of your colleagues in the LA Phil who I just interviewed last week about his audition prep stuff, honesty pill, Chris, Christopher still. Yeah. And it's, it's great that there's, you know, so much, so many entrepreneurial minded musicians in, in the LA Phil. Cause it's not, it's not really that common yet. And like, right. I wonder, I wonder though, like as, as people start to think about this, some people are going to say, and I, I have heard people say this to me directly. Um, but I'm not in the LA Phil. I'm not in a top five orchestra. How can I possibly create a program like this and expect that people will want to study with me? So like, what would you have to say about that? Right. Well, I mean, what you, the, the word that commonly people write about in business is authority, right? So that's, yeah. that's what we're talking about. And, um, you know, that is one of, that's one of the pillars, I guess you could say of, of, a successful business, um, mm-hmm. but it's not the only one. And you could say it's not even the most important one. Um, you know, I would hope that anybody who wants to help others in music or, or on instruments would be serious about it and would take their craft seriously and, and all of that. I mean, we don't need people coming in and selling snake oil, but, um, but at the same time, um, you don't have to have a title, you don't have to have a position in order to have authority. You know, authority can be, you can establish it very quickly with a title or you can build it over time. And really it's the building it over time that's going to last and to ultimately to, to bear more fruit. Um, because exactly. thinking about, yeah, I mean, thinking about my titles and, and positions again, yeah, they can grab attention early on, they can establish authority in the minds of some people who want to see that. But it's really only going to go so far. Um, If people are going to work with me long term, uh, they really need to see much more than that. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, like I think on our, um, we've talked about this before, you know, and you said, that there's the no like trust factor, right? Right. And you've been showing up for a long time building that. So, you know, it's, it's a nice feature to your credibility that you have the title, but also that you've been showing up and, and sharing and teaching for free. I think that's one of the things that really, that really builds, um, builds credibility and, builds authority is showing up and sharing your expertise and contributing to your audience in that way, um, you know, consistently and sharing so that people kind of have an idea of what it would be like to work with you before they actually do. And people can do that by watching your videos and reading your yeah, book. It can be hard to know, even now it, it's hard to know, you know, what things you want to just put out there for free what things need to cost money. I mean, there, and again, I'm not um, the greatest (laughs) mind as far as this, but I I feel like I have, I'm getting a better sense of where that line is. And and for me, it honestly comes down to things that just bug me like this, this should be (laughs) out there. This is not that hard. All of us have hobbies, you know, um, uh, just to think of, one like golf, you know, I play a lot of golf and I remember some simple tips um, that I learned at certain points playing golf that, that really made a big difference to me that were really very basic and simple. And, you know, I, obviously I didn't go to golf school or anything like that. So (laughs) I had just never heard these 
they would be things that every accomplished or professional golfer would know, um, but I didn't know them. And they, they made a big difference to me. And there are thousands of those things on the violin or for every instrument. And when I discover one of the, or I discovered that a lot of violinists don't know one of those things, I feel like it's, it's gotta be my mission to put it right. out there. Like this doesn't have to be that hard. Um, and when you can do that and make an immediate difference for people, then talk about building authority or trust. I mean, that's yeah. what really does it. Um, oh yeah. Cause it used to bother me, you know, in the early days of this, um, when I started looking at what I was doing as a business, um, and then obviously in business, there's competition eventually. Um, you know, I, I would start looking around at other violinists and sometimes it would bug me, uh, you know, see someone would make a comment on one of my videos maybe. And if anybody who's put a video out there, you, you know, <laughs> they're mean comments, on YouTube. But... <laughs> People are mean on YouTube. I've you know, but they it. might say like, uh, you know, this, this seems okay, but um, <laughs> here's this other video that that's, you know, way better. And, you know, I'd go and see that video and I'd think like, oh, well, the, you know, this person doesn't know what they're talking about at all. You know, how can they think that, that this person is, and uh, you know, I started asking myself, yes, how, how can they think? Well, let me go and check out this person's website. And they have a lot of information on here and it's pretty well organized. And there are answers to a lot more questions than are on my website. And maybe I don't agree with all the answers, but you know, that's how someone going around YouTube would end up on that person's website and think, oh, this person really helped me out. So you know, the question is, am I really interested in helping out that person? Maybe the answer is no. I mean, if it's just someone searching around YouTube uh, for random violin questions, maybe that's not the person I want to spend right. the vast majority of my time uh, working with. But if it is, then you have to listen to what questions they're asking and what language they use. Right. And, you know, you bring up something really valuable, too, is, is as musicians, we're conditioned to be to, you know, to seek out someone else who's doing what seems like exactly the same thing as what we're doing and go, oh, but that sucks because it's not me, you know, like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> yeah. so, I'm so, I'm so guilty of this, you know, like hearing another horn player and being like, yeah, it's just not, the sound isn't right, you know, like, because oh, yeah. you, you know, yeah, immediately. And so like doing this, when you start a business online and you see something that's a little bit similar to you, it can it can bring that that back it can bring that twinge of competitiveness and like kind of yeah this like kind of cutthroaty kind of feeling back a little bit but you're right it's a different audience like all the time it's it's a different audience because it's a different vibe because you're unique and you're you and and the way that you teach and the way that you present it is going to be different from someone who's attracted to that other person's website with all the answers even if they're not the answers you know but you can right. but you could go down that you could go down that rabbit hole and go oh but maybe my website doesn't have enough answers like you can start to double you know second guess yourself and so i think there's something to be said for like seeing it acknowledging it putting the blinders back on and continuing to make your great work without looking at it you know knowing that knowing that if someone's attracted to what you're doing they're going to work with you and if they're not, they'll go find some answers somewhere else. So, yeah. And, you know, ironically, that would be, you know, competition would be a great <laughs> problem to have, actually. I mean, I look forward to the day, as I think you do too, when there are all kinds of violinists and every instrumentalist out there doing this because yeah. then there will be real world examples of, of what that kind of teaching and what that kind of learning looks like uh, totally. in music because totally. the biggest you know when i'm talking to people about this um you know people that might want to work with me you know their their biggest um questions are not like oh but you know this other guy's doing this you know what do you bring to the table or, or i'm not sure if we're going to cover the etudes i want to cover you know it's nothing like that it's more like, how does this even work like how could right how could I change my playing just work and I'm never going to see you. Right. Um, so once, you know, if there were 20 other violinists out there doing that, that wouldn't even be much of a question. 
Yeah. Well, you know what? It's, it's going to happen over the next five to 10 years. I, I'm sure we'll listen back to this in five years and go, remember back then when there was like, you know, just Nate's program and that was pretty much the only violin program you could join, you know, <laughs> like it's true. And, and I was, you know, I was actually talking to Jennifer about this. This is sort of a whole can of worms, so I won't really go into it, but like in the business world, if you have a program coming out, you go on somebody's podcast who has, you know, who gets like millions of downloads and you can promote something because, you know, the podcast is about online solutions for X, Y, Z, right? For business. Right. And so like here in our space, everything is so new that like even the framework for promoting something like what you're doing isn't entirely fully in place. I'm trying right. to do my part with that, you know, right now. Yes, um, thank you for that too. <laughs> and I, I hope that more people come to me with, um, with their, with their offerings because I think, I think this is my my secret mission is to, <laughs> is to make a really viable, um, obvious option to college, to repeated degrees. Because I mean, personally, like if something like what you're doing existed for me, if it was 2020 and I was 22 years old, you know, and there was some horn player that I respected that I could have, you know, studied with this way instead of going 60 grand in debt, I would have done it, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the real thing. You know, when we were talking before about music school and conservatory and you were talking about how a lot of times the the biggest memories were not necessarily the lessons, but hanging out with fellow students and um, those conversations. It, in a way, that makes it sound like that, that's a great ad for music school, right? Because yeah. <laughs> but then the question is, uh, what about the people for whom that doesn't work when they're right? 18? And should it cost sixty thousand dollars to get that? Like, right. You know, and it if, shouldn't. If you don't have that money, and if you if you happen not to get in right then, or if if you go into another field at that time, are you should you be shut out? forever right. um, from quality training and, and that studio feel because um, that's how it is now. I mean, the doors are just closed. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's, I didn't want to make it seem like we, because <laughs> we were talking about some great things about music school and, <laughs> and, but then at the same time saying how maybe the future could be elsewhere. Um, oh no, totally. No, I agree <laughs> with you. Like my, I think my point there was just saying like, my memories were with, with colleagues more so than, than, um, you know, going into that lesson once a week and then not seeing that teacher again I know, me until too. the following week, you know? So, and this way you have support, continual support, um, you know, and messaging too. They, you know, people can probably contact you if they have some burning question that they have. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. the idea. Cause I couldn't have, you know, I didn't have my teacher's phone numbers or email addresses. And, you know, I'm not sure I would have bugged them right. midweek anyway. That's just not how things worked. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not like I'm not an ER physician on call 24 seven, but at the same time, <laughs> if it's the middle of the week and I'm not going to see someone in my program um, for another few days, I love being able to just answer a question or give some guidance when I can. Yeah, totally. Um, to say like, this is kind of a dead end, what you're talking about, or no, this is absolutely the right direction. Keep, keep pushing in that direction. Exactly. I love it. So if um, someone is interested in your program, how do they get in touch? Well, uh, basically go to natesviolin.com. Okay. And uh, I have a contact page there. Um, and you can check out the Virtuoso Master course there. Um, if it's not open at the time that you go, then you can get to be on the priority waiting list for the next one. Uh-huh. Okay. But uh, it's a six-month program. So, yeah. That's awesome. I love it. And the next one is opening in January? Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure when when this episode will go out. This episode will go out at the beginning of January. So, okay. Yeah. I will have just started that one. So, okay. So it would be the perfect time if you're interested in starting in the summer of 2020 
um, to go ahead and get on that priority list so that we can, and you know, what I often do is start talking or even sometimes if I can fit it in, if someone's really interested in starting the next program, we'll be able to work once together, you know, before the official start. Sometimes that's, great. that's something I can do. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. And also before we end, I want to um, mention that you have a podcast with your wife, Akiko. And so it's called Sand Partners for Life. Yep. And um, what do you guys talk about? Well, it's focused on the orchestral life because that is our, <laughs> that's yeah. our life. But um, also because we're married and we have a family, um, it touches on the whole, the whole life, not just work life, but um, behind the scenes, our relationships to the violin. And yeah, what, what does it look like to, to be a full-time professional musician? Um, because I keep hearing from younger people that they appreciate hearing about the things that are not the minutes and hours we spend on stage. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't, we don't talk about all the details of doing laundry and, and everything like that. It's, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not a reality show, um, <laughs> but we, uh, episode by episode, I mean, they, they have different focuses. Um, you know, sometimes we'll focus on just simply nerves, like uh, <laughs> what happens when we get nervous on stage playing in orchestra versus solo. Um, what are the solutions we have for that? Um, we do bring special guests on. Um, and of course, in those cases, we'll, we'll focus on somebody's interesting path that they took maybe to get to the orchestra or to do whatever it is they're doing with music. And, um, and then we have just fun episodes too. We had, well, since it's stand partners for life, we had a stand partner family feud, basically. We had <laughs> really? Categories for top things that... <laughs> Top things that annoy us. So your stand partner do's and don'ts, basically. Oh, that's good. I want to hear that episode. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, stand partners for, yeah, like you want to make sure you're not doing one of those don'ts if you're going home with the person later, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, what What I've discovered too is that um, you, you, we haven't even really decided whether <laughs> our show is for professional musicians um, or you know, for people who are just really interested in the world, we're, we're still leaving that open-ended. And many of the people that I hear from are people who go to concerts. They're not musicians themselves at all, but they, they really love hearing what goes into, you know, what else happens during the week before the performance they see on stage. And they love the minutia of, yeah, the stand partner relationship, you know, yeah. who turns the pencil, who turns the pages. You know, I'm a film person and I, you know, I love hearing about the jobs that all the people do to bring together a successful film and the process and all that. So. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I know that audience members are interested in, in the orchestra members lives and the fact that you guys are married. Probably people say that all the time, like, Oh really? You're married. That's so wonderful. Like, I mean, it's so funny because I sometimes, you know, if, if, um, especially if my husband is soloing and I'll be in the audience and I can hear people talking about him and oh, his daughter wow. or something like I'm like incognito, like, Oh, have you, you know, they'll say, they'll say little things. And I'm like, they're, they're talking about me. They're talking about him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So like, I'm that yeah, person. it's so funny. So I'm sure people say that about you guys. So now they can be like, Ooh, we get to know everything about Nathan and Akiko's life. That's so exciting. We, yeah, we have had that experience a couple of times where someone will come up and say, oh, I'm, you know, <laughs> I feel like I know you guys. And yeah, um, that, that's, yeah, we're, we're very, very far from any kind of celebrity status, but we have had a few people <laughs> say that they know <laughs> a lot about our lives and, um, and that's fine. We, we enjoy letting people in on, on that who are interested. That's and, awesome. you know, honestly, if, if we want to be able to keep doing what we're doing, which is play orchestral music uh we need those audience members <laughs> to stay exactly. interested. exactly exactly that's a really great point awesome well thank you so much nate thanks for being on the show today i really enjoyed hearing all about you know your launch and and just the path up until it up until now it's great oh thank you no this was lots of fun thank thanks for having me on the show absolutely thanks a lot 
I'm Tracy Friedlander, and you've been listening to the Crushing Classical podcast. You can follow Crushing Classical on Instagram and Facebook at Crushing Classical. If you haven't yet, you can go to Apple Podcast and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Your reviews help others to find these conversations. Thanks for listening.